Hi, my name's Toby Mountjoy, and this is The Autism Show. This is gonna be an exciting show because we're gonna to start to talk all about treatment. If you're a parent starting an endeavor on the journey, trying to figure out what to do, how you can help your child, selecting the right treatment uh, is obviously a really, really important choice. So we're gonna be reviewing a lot of different treatments, and most importantly, we're gonna be looking at what does the science say? You know, have there been studies to show it's effective? Um, how do we know it's gonna help your child? And not just rely upon you know, somebody's opinion or someone that just tells you something. I'm gonna start by talking about the gluten-free, casein-free diet. This has been around for a long time. The casein-free diet was first identified for use in schizophrenia. It was believed that there's a possible genetic effect that results in what's called a leaky gut syndrome. This results in an overload of gluten from wheat and casein from dairy. It's been posited that this causes high peptide levels, which may produce opioid-like effects. And these opioid effects can be manifested in behavioral symptoms that are commonly seen in autism or the broader category of autism spectrum disorder. There are many, many people that advocate this diet. And actually, it's not just advocated for autism. You'll find actually when you look at ADHD and many other conditions, this is a diet that's often recommended uh, to parents. Um, for varying different reasons. It seems that about in my clinic, 80% of children are sensitized to those two products, gluten and dairy. And by the removal of it, you can alleviate diarrhea, constipation, gas, bowel pain, nighttime awakenings, it's amazing. So I'd recommend to every parent, once they get the diagnosis, to remove gluten and dairy. Here's another clip from uh, Dr. Doreen Grampachet, who is uh, also a behavior analyst. When they get off of casein, a lot of times, a lot of times, parents come back to me and say, oh my God, it's like he woke up and all of a sudden he's learning so much more and he's so much more aware. Um, children who get off of gluten, it's more of a gradual type of thing. It's not as acute, but it is major. Like the child sleeps better, the child digests their food better, um, has, you know, more regular bowel movements, not no more pain. There's a lot of things like that. So um, I do recommend the diet. Now let's hear from some parents uh, who are talking about the gluten-free, casein-free diet and their experiences. One of the first things we did is stop dairy. We took him off of cow's milk and saw an incredible change in his behavior. So as you can see, I think if I listened to all of those people, I'd feel very convinced that probably this is a diet that I should go on. That children with autism definitely have some kind of problem in processing uh, gluten and casein. Um, and they're not part of that just sort of like group in the general population that sometimes has difficulties. That this is something almost specific to autism and every child with autism should follow this kind of diet. When you go on this diet, there's gonna be these miraculous changes. Um, and that perhaps it's because of what they've been eating has been causing this, this kind of problem and condition. It's very, very widespread um, in terms of you know, parents doing this kind of diet. So I think we just have to look again, it's like, well, what does the science say? There surely must have been some studies looking at children um, eating gluten-free diets versus other kinds of diets and you know, being able to demonstrate change in many areas. Let's have a look at what the science says a months-long, double-blind controlled study. They put 14 kids with autism on a gluten-free, casein-free diet for four to six weeks, and then for the next three months challenged them every week with double-blind, placebo-controlled food tests, secretly giving them gluten, just gluten, or just casein, or both, or neither, every week, month after month. Here's what happened to each of the 14 kids in terms of their social relationships and their language skills throughout each of the challenges, and bottom line, nothing. No apparent impact on behavioral disturbances or autism-related behaviors. Views of the sum total of evidence, like this one published 2017 in the Journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, concluding that although some studies showed benefits, the data are inadequate to make conclusions either way. In other words, the SOE, the strength of evidence, is considered insufficient to endorse such diets. Overall evidence for the effectiveness of these diets is weak, and thus these diets cannot be generally recommended as a treatment, yet parents continue to give it a try. There are the potential downsides. 
like further stigmatization, diversion of resources away from other treatments, and, they suggest, a concern about nutritional deficiency. So as you can see, it's not always so obvious, um, and again states the reason why we probably really need to understand more about the interventions we're undertaking. Another intervention is fish oil, omega-3. You hear about this a lot, actually, in not just for children with autism, but all kinds of people will talk about omega-3s being good for the brain, and you know if you've got short memory loss or all kinds of things that you know you should be taking omega threes as part of your your diet or as a supplement. To find out a bit more about what does it do, is that fish oil is comprised of fatty acids called DHA and EPA that are thought to be important in brain structure and function. Like omega threes, and we rely on them for proper brain, eye, and heart function. Here's a doctor that strongly advocates for this for, for children with autism. A lot of data on omega-3 fish oil that uh, helps with uh, IQ, fine motor, fine motor development, speech and language development, and is actually um, a very important part of a child's brain development. And let's hear it from a parent who, again, is a big advocate for this approach of treatment. We wear foods, wear supplements, helps in improving the vision, the focus, the attention, and also in general the mood and the behavior, and in fact even the immunity for kids with autism specifically. Actually there has been uh, a number of studies looking at children with autism and fish oil as a supplement. There is actually isn't a great deal of evidence that fish oil can help learning and behavior in kids on the spectrum. Now the study we've linked to today provided a rigorous test of fish oil use in 38 kids on the spectrum. Half of the children received fish oil daily for a period of six months, and half, the other half of uh, the children received a placebo for six months. Now the main finding was actually a null finding, and that was that at the end of six months, there was no difference between the two groups in the measures of behavior and learning. So the main finding here is that there actually isn't any evidence at the moment that fish oil can improve learning and behavior in kids on the spectrum. Of 200 milligrams a day of DHA, one of the long chain omega-3s, and no effect. So here all these kids are taking it, despite the lack of evidence that it actually does any good. Maybe they just didn't give enough? OK, how about a randomized placebo-controlled trial of 1,500 milligrams of long-chain omega-3s, and a high dose didn't work either. Put all the studies together, and omega-3 supplementation simply does not appear to affect mm. autism. Another treatment that you'll see um, a little bit less so these days, um, very much so five years ago, is parents are sometimes advocated to go and get a hair test or a blood test to check for the presence of heavy metals and other kind of irregularities in, in the blood. And they would send those um, samples, usually off to a lab in the United States, and they will come back with their results. So, and often those results are, you know, striking. They may indicate that there's high levels of lead or mercury in particular, and that indicates that perhaps that's what is causing uh, the child to experience these symptoms of autism. Um, so let's find out a little bit more about, you know, what are these tests about and how are they conducted, um, and are they useful? Now, the most accurate way to test and see if you have high heavy metals within your body is to do a provoked heavy metal test. And how that test works is that we give you a chelating agent. Now what happens is that those chelating agents actually have an affinity for these heavy metals. So they will bind the heavy metals in the tissues, they'll bring them into circulation, then the kidneys will filter these substances, and then we will urinate out these heavy metals and these chelating agents. Here's a parent's experience with the testing process. We did use uh, chelation therapy for my son. Uh, we did it under the doctor's guidance, of course, and the reason why we chose to do that is because his lab testing initially came back very high with the toxic metals in his system, and just as a mom, I just didn't feel good knowing that he was high in these metals. Brain that is not going to function well. Think about our kids and the symptoms they experience. A lot of those symptoms are neurological symptoms, and so it's no wonder that a lot of us wonder about heavy metal exposure and heavy metal toxicity for our kids. 
So what does the science say about these tests? Are they, you know, regulated? Are they, are they really safe? Do they really show that the children have got these very high levels of, of metals, which would be very, very alarming if you're a parent? Urine mobilization test, challenge test, or provoked urine test are all terms used to describe the administration of a chelating agent, uh, a heavy metal binding agent, to a person prior to the collection of their urine, to test to see the level of heavy metal burden within their bodies. But pediatric public health and toxicology authorities recommend against the use of these tests based on a lack of scientific validation and a lack of demonstrated benefits to the patients, usually promoted by alternative practitioners as the basis for recommending, promoting, and selling to the patient questionable and often inappropriate therapies supposedly aimed at detoxification. Despite this disapproval, the tests are still commonly used and recommended by some practitioners. This is what the results end up looking like. Uh-oh, looks like mercury is in the red. It's easy for uninformed patients and providers to infer that a result that falls on the yellow or red background signifies heavy metal poisoning, but that's because they're not reading the fine print. That reference interval, that normal green range, is the level under non-provoked conditions, meaning normal urine, not urine from someone who was just given a chelating drug to provoke the response to intentionally grab onto heavy metals in the body and pull them out into the urine. That's like giving someone a drug that raises their heart rate, like a shot of adrenaline, then taking their pulse and being like, wow, you got an abnormally high heart rate. Uh, compared to other people who just got a shot of adrenaline, no, just compared to regular resting heart rate. So as you can see, they may not necessarily be as reliable as you think, and some of the results may be quite skewed to give you a really, really different uh, picture of what is really, really happening with the children. So often, when you have your test results back and you realize my child's blood level of mercury, et cetera, is really off the charts, parents are often to inquire, what do I do? And what is often recommended at that stage is to do a, some kind of chelation process to take those metals out of the body and to restore them to normal levels. Let's find out about what is chelation. Now, chelation therapy is actually, it's, it's, it's a legitimate medical treatment, but it's used to remove heavy metals from the body. So what happens is it's usually done sometimes in pill form, usually with an IV. Um, they go in, they have chelating agents, which uh, means that they bind to, say, mercury or iron or lead, and then it's, it's excreted from the body, usually from the urine. So it would be used properly for things like industrial accidents or if somebody had lead poisoning. But there was this thing uh, over the last several years, uh, you may have heard, for instance, the controversy around vaccines. Right. People thought that perhaps mercury uh, in vaccines was causing autism. So the same thinking, uh, similar, uh, people thought that perhaps if you removed metals from children with, uh, with autism, that that would help. Here's a parent's experience of this process. Well, children with autism, there seems to be a correlation where they have a higher rate of having that trait present. So I don't know if anyone really knows why, but children Children with autism are at a higher risk of having heavy metal toxicity um, if they have that gene expression. And here's a doctor talking about um, heavy metals and their removal. Chelation might be a very important medical intervention that we can take. What we do is we give them a medication that's designed to remove, say, lead or mercury or arsenic. And by introducing that in their body, it actually goes around in closet like, like like the talons of an eagle, and pulls it out of their body. What we tend to do is first establish whether heavy metals might be a problem. We could do that with some blood tests. And then if so, we can then give them the chelator that we choose, that we think the child would benefit from, and get a urine before we even do chelation, and then get a urine after. What does the science say about these procedures and about when these metals have been removed or how they're removed? Does that change? Um, the outlook for children with autism, does that change their behavior over time? Treatment for which we have no evidence of benefit and we have evidence of harm. Anything from just co causing heart arrhythmia, so irregular heart rhythm, uh, to kidney damage, to damage to the heart muscle, all the way to death. A half million people with autism are subjected to chelation therapy in the U.S. every year, despite no clinical trial evidence suggesting there's any benefit. Why not just give it a try, though? Because there's potential for side effects like death. They're referring to this case, where doctors were like, oops, they just gave the wrong drug. Should have been given editate calcium disodium, not just straight editate disodium. 
But this may have been no accident. That's exactly what's recommended by leading chelation proponents. As such, it would have been surprising only if the practitioner had not chosen it. So this may not just be a simple matter of the wrong medication being administered. It's an interesting fact that despite there being really no scientific evidence or support for many of these different treatments in autism, that professionals still advocate them on a regular basis, and parents still undertake those kinds of treatments in order to try to help their children. We'll be exploring more sort of why that happens and this kind of phenomenon in later shows. Thanks so much for watching today.